Good morning, Grace. Uh, welcome to another Friday. Uh, we are going to uh, be reading from Luke chapter 20 today, uh, verses 1 through 18. Um, just picking one one smaller section of uh, of uh, the reading for today. And uh, we're going to be dealing with the matter of the authority of Jesus and uh, the rebellion um, against that authority. So um, let's pray and then let's uh, look at uh, Luke chapter 20, uh, verse 1 through 18. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you that your word is true. Thank you that uh, when we read your word, you're confronting us with the way things really are, with the, with the actual truth. Um, we all live our lives according to perceived truth. And uh, Father, I just pray that you would help us uh, to perceive the truth correctly and to act according to the truth uh, that is true, namely your word. Um, thank you, uh, Father. Um, yeah, thank you so much for all you have done through Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. So, um, I'm going to just go ahead and read uh, Luke chapter 18, or chapter 20, 1 through 18. Uh, and then I just want to ask uh, really four simple questions about the text um, and answer them from the text. So uh, let's go ahead and begin in, in verse 1 of chapter 20. One day, as Jesus was teaching the people in the temple courts and proclaiming the good news, the chief priests and the teachers of the law, together with the elders, came up to him. Tell us by what authority you're doing these things, they said. Who gave you this authority? He replied, I will also ask you a question. Tell me, John's baptism, was it from heaven or of human origin? They discussed it among themselves and said, If we say from heaven, he will ask, Why didn't you believe him? But if we say of human origin, all the people will stone us because they are persuaded that John was a prophet. So they answered, We don't know where it came from. Jesus said, Neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. He went on to tell the people this parable. A man planted a vineyard, rented it to some farmers, and went away for a long time. At harvest time, he sent a servant to the tenants so that they would give him some of the fruit of the vineyard. But the tenants beat him and sent him away empty-handed. He sent another servant, but that one also they beat and treated shamefully and sent away empty-handed. He sent still a third, and they wounded him and threw him out. Then the owner of the vineyard said, What shall I do? I will send my son, whom I love. Perhaps they will respect him. But when the tenants saw him, they talked the matter over. This is the heir, they said. Let's kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. So they threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. What then will the owner of the vineyard do to them? He will come and kill those tenants and give the vineyard to others. When the people heard this, they said, God forbid. Jesus looked directly at them and said, and asked, Then what is the meaning of that which is written? The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces. Anyone on whom it falls will be crushed. The teachers of the law and the chief priests looked for a way to arrest him immediately because they knew he had spoken this parable against them. But they were afraid of the people. Uh, so I just want to ask four really simple questions about this text. Um, uh, some more simple than others, or the answer is more simple than others. Uh, but I want to start with this. What was Jesus doing that prompted this question? Um, and, and that's a really easy one to, to answer because all it causes us to do is to look back on what we've learned so far in the Gospel of Luke. Um, now I'm not going to go back to the beginning, obviously, but just to look in the previous chapter, um, in, in chapter 19, the first story we have in chapter 19 is Jesus and Zacchaeus. So we see that, I'm about to sneeze here, uh, so we see that Jesus uh, is calling people to repent. <coughs> Jesus is calling people to repent, and they actually are repenting. Uh, remember, you know, Jesus' primary message is preaching the gospel, uh, and we know that this is at least the same message that John uh, the Baptist was, was preaching, and that's repent, because the kingdom of heaven is near. And, and people like Zacchaeus are, are believing the message and are changing. Uh, they're repenting um, and, and trusting in God. And, so, um, and then we have, um, I'm going to skip ahead a little bit, I'm going to skip the parable of the Minas, um, but uh, the triumphal entry, we have Jesus coming into uh, to, um, Jerusalem, and we have people uh, responding, welcoming him as a triumphant king. Uh, and this is really, really awesome. And then, and then the, some of the Pharisees confront him because people are like saying, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. This is, there is a very high welcome of who he is. And I think it's acknowledgement of him as the Messiah. 
And um, and the Pharisees are are saying, "Hey, you need to rebuke your disciples for what they're doing and what they're saying." And he says, "Hey, if I if I if I tell them to be quiet, if they're actually quiet, then these, even the stones will cry out." Um, which is really just an awesome statement about who he is. We're not going to go into that right now. Um, and then we see Jesus lamenting over, uh, weeping over Jerusalem. And um, and we see him, uh, because of what's coming, uh, the, the destruction that's eventually coming. And then we see uh, he clears out the temple. And I think this is really, between his clearing out the temple and uh, his teaching, I think this is primarily what the, what the Pharisees have a problem with. Um, because in order for him, in order for Jesus to be clearing out the temple, he needs to be, he needs to have authority over the temple. In order for him to teach God's word with authority, he needs to have authority in God's word. And, 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 and these things are very, very distinct about Jesus' teaching versus other uh, teachings, is that when Jesus taught, he taught with authority. Um, and, uh, and many, many times correcting uh, false understandings of God's word. And so... Um, and then, of course, uh, receiving the praise of people, um, you know, a whole number of things that Jesus has been doing that require godly authority. And and it's about these things that the Pharisees, um, or that the chief priests, rather, um, uh, the chief priests and the scribes and the elders uh, come up to him and question about, where's your authority? Uh, where's your authority come from? Um, and so uh, the second question that I want to deal with is, uh, and just to be, I guess, a little bit more succinct about those answers, uh, the, the things that Jesus were doing, that was doing that, were, that, that um, prompted this question was that he was doing miracles, he was teaching with authority, uh, he was being praised, uh, he was being acknowledged as the Messiah, uh, and he cleared the temple. And so it's, I think it's probably mainly about the clearing of the temple, but about a lot of these things that the, that the uh, chief priests and the elders are questioning. Um, secondly, how does Jesus answer without answering plainly? Because he doesn't answer, you know, just in a very, very plain way, but he does answer the question, and he does so uh, several different times. Um, so the, the first way he answers um, is in his question about John the Baptist. Uh, and he really kind of, he narrows the the possibilities down uh, by answering uh, or by asking this question about John the Baptist. He says, I'm going to ask you a question too uh, the, the, about the baptism of John uh, that John was teaching. Was that from heaven or was that from men? Because um, really it boils down to it's either from heaven, from God, or it's not from God, it's from men. Um, he doesn't bother about all these other different sources that a person might say something is from, he says it boils down to this, either it's from heaven or it's from men, and he asks them uh, about John, which is it? Um, I think there's a lot of reasons why he would ask this question about John, um, and, uh, you know, one, because John preached the same thing that Jesus is preaching, and John preached the coming of the Messiah. So, um, I think that's, you know, the two main reasons why he would ask about John the Baptist. And then also the, there's the fact that um, the Pharisees didn't accept John's teaching. And so uh, he points to this, and then these guys conspire uh, among themselves, and they, they, um, they say, well, you know, if we say that John's teaching came from heaven, he's going to ask us why then we didn't repent. And, and, in, um, and in Matthew chapter 21, when we see this same thing given, uh, Jesus tells uh, in between um, his authority being challenged and the parable of the tenants, uh, Jesus um, tells a, a parable of the two sons. And he talks about, you know, the one who really obeys is the one who um, actually does what, what his father commanded, not just the one who says he will and then doesn't. Or, or rather, not the one who says he will and doesn't. And so Jesus in that parable in Matthew is, is likening the, the chief priests, the scribes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, all the religious elite who are actually hypocritical. He's saying, you guys are just like that, um, that second son who said he wouldn't go, or said he would go, but he didn't. Um, you guys are like that. You're, you're claiming to obey God, but you're not actually obeying him. And so um, that's one way that Jesus 
uh, answers the question is through this question about John the Baptist. And another way is through some Old Testament uh, quotes. And uh, Jesus, I guess the first one is not really a quote, but this idea of the uh, telling the parable about a vineyard, um, if we look back at Isaiah chapter 5, um, and go ahead and read Isaiah chapter 5, 1 through 7. Um, yeah, I, I think I have time. I'm going to go ahead and read those verses really quickly, uh, and then I would, I would encourage you to do the same and do it more slowly. Um, it starts out this way. Let me sing for my beloved my love song concerning his vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug it and cleared it of stones and planted it with choice vines. He built a watchtower in the midst of it, hewed out a, vine, a wine vat in it, and he looked for it to yield grapes, but it yielded wild grapes. Now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there to do for my vineyard that I have not done in it? When I looked for it to yield grapes, why did it yield wild grapes? And now I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will remove its hedge, and it shall be devoured. I will break down its wall, and it shall be trampled down. I will make it a waste. It shall not be pruned or hoed, and briars and thorns will grow up. I will also command the clouds that they will, uh, that no rain, that they rain no rain on it, upon it, for the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah are his pleasant planting. And he looked for justice, but behold, bloodshed; for righteousness, but behold, an outcry. And and so when when Jesus talks about a vineyard owner, um, or a guy who plants a vineyard. He's making a clear reference to God here, that God is the one who plants the vineyard, and that the vineyard, uh, here very specifically, the vineyard um, of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the, the fruit that he's looking for is righteousness and justice, which amounts to obedience, right? Um, obedience from, right, from a right heart. Um, now, there's a lot more we could go into. I'm not going to go into it now for the sake of time and for the sake... It, it, and. You know, it wasn't really my desire to, or my plan to, to, to teach all the Isaiah passages and the Psalms that we're going to look at. But just to show you um, that when Jesus uses this parable, he's pointing uh, to uh, God. He's saying, look, um, in my parable, the, the guy who plants the vineyard is God. Just like the same, just like Isaiah, um, just like God revealed in Isaiah, the one who does the planting is God. And so Jesus is going to explain who the who he is through this parable. Um, another thing that I want to point you to is Isaiah chapter 8, um, because Jesus talks about this at the end. Um, and, and it's another way of showing who, uh, who he is. Um, he says um, in verse 14 of chapter 8, he, and the he here is God, he will become a sanctuary and a stone of offense and a rock of stumbling to both houses of Israel, a trap and a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And many shall stumble on it. They shall fall and be broken. They shall be snared and taken. Um, so just to, uh, again, um, you know, when Jesus talks about this, this stone of offense, this stone of stumbling in his parable, um, uh, or when he's talking to uh, the, the chief priests and the scribes, um, he's also, in a way, quoting here from Isaiah, and he says here in verse 14 that God becomes a sanctuary and a stone of offense. So it's like God is this, is this very strong rock. Like multiple times in the Old Testament, God is compared to a stone or a rock or a firm foundation. Um, and, and the picture is that God is a sanctuary, like when David uses the metaphor a fortress or a sanctuary uh, in um, in the wilderness, um, he's likening uh, God's protection to the caves where he took shelter in, and that God is a shelter, God is a sanctuary, and it's the same thing Isaiah is saying that God is a strong fortress. He's either a fortress that you uh, a, like a big strong stone that you take refuge in if you trust in him and obey him and honor him as God, or he's a stone of stumbling for those who, um, for those who reject him and that they trip on him and they, and they fall over him and they, they're, they're, they're broken to pieces uh, when they stumble over him. And so God is the same strong uh, fortress, the same strong stone, um, but to those who take refuge um, in him, who believe in him, uh, he's sanctuary. And to those who fall over him, they're crushed, they're broken. Um, 
And then in Psalm uh, 118, uh, which I would say Jesus also references, uh, and you'll see why. I'm going to only read some of it, um, but really, honestly, uh, I would strongly encourage you to go back and read Psalm 118, because this is written to the one uh, who who would trust in the Lord, who would take refuge in the Lord. And um, and I re- this is a beautiful psalm. I uh, don't have time to go into the whole thing now, but I would, I'm going to take you right to verse um, 18. He says, The Lord has disciplined me severely, but he has not given me over to death. Open to me the gates of righteousness that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. Uh, And then later, of course, uh, we see the same uh, in verse 26. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. Um, One of the things that the people were saying uh, as Jesus was coming in uh, just a little bit prior to this story uh, in the Gospel of Luke. And that's how people were welcoming Jesus. Um, But this idea here in verse uh, 22, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, um, that... Uh, if you want to make a um, if you want to make a spiritual connection here, the understanding of you know what is righteousness and and if you're trying to build righteousness and and like the Pharisees, like the Sadducees, like the teachers of the law, like the elders and the scribes and 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 the chief priests of the people, they were operating according to the idea that they could be righteous. They could take the law and they could put it into practice and they could build their own righteousness. And what Jesus is saying is the same thing as that Isaiah was saying, the same thing that the writer of Psalm 118 was saying, is that you can't be righteous without God who makes you righteous. And it's through these quotations, through the, the idea of the vineyard and the, the builder being God, and um, and then even through the parable where he's like, so so God sent um, all these different prophets who are the, the, the servants of the king in this parable or the servants of the vineyard owner in this parable um, to collect the fruit. And the same righteousness that he's talking about um, in, uh, in the book of Isaiah, the righteousness that he's, or the fruit that he's looking for is justice, righteousness, obedience, honor is God. Um, and so, and, and that's not what he's getting. Right? That's why he's sending the prophets. That's why God sent the prophets to remind the people that they needed to be obeying God. They needed to really and truly fear and honor God. And they weren't doing it. Um, and so through all these different quotes, uh, and then through the way he tells the parable, Jesus is showing who he is. That he is, in fact, the Son of God. Uh, he is the Son of the owner of the vineyard. He is the one to whom... Uh, their praise and their honor and their their glory and their obedience and submission is due. And so that leads us to the next question, because in the parable, it seems that they already know the answer. Um, and um, I would say that there, the, 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 that in two ways, we see that these guys already knew the answer. Uh, one, in their sort of plotting, and their refusal to answer his question about John the Baptist. Jesus says, you know, really there's only two sources of authority. Just like with John, either the teaching that I'm giving you and the things that I'm doing come from God, or they come from man. And they had the overwhelming evidence uh, that through, through the miracles that Jesus' uh, authority came from God. Uh, nobody else ever in the whole history of, of, of prophets, um, uh, uh, in the whole history of the world, nobody has ever done as many miracles as Jesus Christ did when he was on the earth. Um, and and they had the overwhelming testimony of that, that his authority was from God. Uh, and even several characters in the, in the uh, several people in the biblical, uh, in the gospel accounts tell us this. Um, I'm thinking about the man born blind. Uh, I think it's in John chapter 9, where he tells the, the Pharisees, he's like, we know this guy's from God because God doesn't listen to sinners. And who else has heard of a man who's, who was born blind being given his sight? Um, we, he has to be from God. 
So they had the evidence of that. They had the evidence of John the Baptist because in Matthew 21, which is kind of the same story, but in, in Matthew, uh, in Matthew's gospel, um, Jesus says, hey, look, you guys saw that the tax collectors and the prostitutes listened to John and repented. And even when you saw the evidence of their changed lives, I mean, that is that they stopped cheating people as tax collectors, like John the Baptist told them. And, um, and, uh, and apparently the, the prostitutes stopped being prostitutes. And so they repented. And even after seeing that evidence, uh, Jesus says, you, you didn't repent. And so they had the testimony of John the Baptist and the people who listened to John the Baptist. And then in verse 14, he just, he just merely makes it very, uh, very clear uh, in uh, verse 14 of chapter 20. He makes it clear that they knew. Um, well, he says the, ten the tenants saw him, that is the son that was sent, and they said to themselves, this is the heir. Let's kill him so that the inheritance may be ours. And, and I think we should, and I think Luke intends to, to help us to see this, that just like the, um, the chief priests and the, the scribes went off by themselves and, or spoke among themselves, and, and just like these guys did here, um, he's, he's equating these two together. And so they recognize the truth of the matter, but they refuse to acknowledge it. And so... You know, Jesus seems to make it very, very clear in this parable that the chief priests, the elders, they recognized that his authority was from God. So not only are they refusing to answer the question about John the Baptist, and they're asking Jesus, even though all the evidence of their eyes and their ears tell them that his authority comes from God, they are turning against that. Um, and, and and I think they do it from a position of knowledge. And I think Luke intends to make that very clear, that these guys willfully uh, rejected the Messiah. They had all the evidence in the world, and they, re they, they rejected him. And so what do we learn from this? Um, well, I think uh, there's a lot of different things we could learn, but I just want to mention uh, a couple. And so as um, first I want to talk to the non-believer, because I... I I'm hoping anyway that somebody watching this uh, is not currently a believer uh, in Jesus as the Messiah, um, as Jesus is the one who died for the sins of, of men and uh, was raised to eternal life, the one who died as a, as a sacrifice of atonement, as a propitiation, uh, appeasing God's wrath, and at the same time bringing near uh, those who would repent and trust in him uh, and reconciling them to God, uh, giving them his righteousness. So their sins are forgiven, and, and the righteousness that they were supposed to live and didn't uh, is credited to their account uh, through Jesus Christ. Um, and, and so for the person who hasn't done that, who hasn't acknowledged that, I just would say this, um, because I talk to a lot of people, uh, I, I try anyway to share the gospel with as many people as I can, um, and, and one of the things that I inevitably hear from people um, is, well, you know, what's the evidence that Jesus is who, who he says he is in the Bible? Or who are, you, who are you claiming that he was? And and I would just say that like these Pharisees, your problem isn't a lack of evidence. Your problem isn't a lack of knowledge unless nobody's told you the gospel or, or told you things from the Bible before. Um, your, your problem is not a, a lack of, of knowledge uh, or a lack of evidence. Your problem is a willful rejection of God. You are actively working against your conscience, which God gave you to let you know what was right and wrong, and you're actively rejecting uh, the testimony of any believer in your life that says, hey, Jesus is the Lord, you need to uh, submit to him. So I would tell you that your problem is not a lack of knowledge or evidence. Your problem is, is a lack of obedience and a, and a lack of acknowledgement of, of the truth. Um, and I think it's the same thing that, that Paul points to in Romans chapter 1. Uh, and for the professing Christian, uh, I would just say, look, the hypocrites in Jesus' day are the same as the hypocrites in any generation. There are people who say one thing and do another. And so the, the pitfall for the Christian here is to know the truth and to not actually respond to it in your heart. 
Um, because anybody can put a face on for two hours on Sunday. Um, anybody can pretend um, on Sunday that they trust in Christ and that they actually don't. And so I would just urge uh, every professing believer um, that the, the evidence here that was desired, uh, we saw it in Isaiah, we see it here. Um, if, we are, if we look back at, um, at John the Baptist's words uh, in the beginning of the Gospel of Luke uh, about what real repentance uh, looks like, um, God wants obedience. He wants obedience from heart, from the heart. He wants a heart uh, level sincerity and submission to himself, um, acknowledgement that his word is right, that we're wrong, that we're sinful, and that we need a savior. Um, and then he wants obedience. He wants us to turn from disobedience and turn towards obedience, uh, having faith in Jesus Christ. So for, for the believer, I would simply say, are you offering lift service but you're not actually obeying? Or are you only obeying uh, when other Christians are around? Um, are you only obeying where people can see you and not at the heart level? And so I would say those are both ways that we could uh, learn from this account. Uh, so um, I hope that has been uh, informative. I hope for the believer it's encouraging because Jesus does have all authority. Jesus' authority is from God because he is God. Um, and so I, I hope that's encouraging. I hope it's convicting for somebody whose faith may not be in, in Jesus Christ. Um, and, and I also hope it's honoring to God, uh, who is the only one who has real authority. Uh, and um, anyway, so uh, I just encourage you to uh, look to Christ today, to obey him, uh, and to make sure that your obedience to him is is at a heart level and, and that you have a desire to obey, to thank God as God, to honor him as God, um, and to worship and to praise him. Um, I hope to see you guys on Sunday. Have a great day.